All right, everybody. So good evening. Uh, my name is Susan M. Hart Servideo. I'm from the Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Ocean County, and there's quite a few of you I see in our, uh, particip our participants list that uh, have been to quite a few of our different programs. And I just wanted to make you aware that um, we don't have chat available, but you can um, go on to the Q and A uh, section. It might be on the three dots, or it'll say Q in the ampersand sign in the A. Um, you can go in there, you can put your question in there or even comments, and then it'll come to uh, the panelists. And then we can either answer or we'll hold the questions until uh, there's a good time for uh, Jessica to answer, unless it's something that's got to get answered right away. Um, so I want to <laughs> introduce um, Patty Dixon, who is my other horticulturist in the office. And tonight we are doing fight the bites uh, mosquito information session and Jessica Keen is here uh, from um, the Ocean County Mosquito Commission and she identifies you're the specialist to identify the uh, mosquitoes. Yes, I'm the mosquito identification specialist. Okay. I do okay. I do the tick ID, so I guess that, you know, mosquitoes too. Um, so I want to just, uh, our next program though, just to give a quick uh, shout out there is um, April 19th at seven. Um, we are doing a spotter and lancer, or I am actually giving the spotter and lancer and fly biology and management um, PowerPoint uh, presentation from actually Penn State had put it together. So I'm going to tailor it a little bit for New Jersey, but um, some great information, great photos. So anybody, uh, spotter and lantern flies are here. So we're going to be dealing with them a lot this year, but from that note, um, Jessica, I'm going to let you uh, take over. If you do care if our videos are on, or would you prefer? Oh, you don't see us anyhow. Never mind. Whatever, whatever you want to do is fine by me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, Jessica. Thank welcome you. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. Okay, so tonight I'm going to talk a little bit. How did I get off this already? Um, about the Ocean County Mosquito Commission give a little bit of information about mosquitoes, how they breed, where to find them, um, different ways that we control them, ways that you can help control them, um, their life cycle, a little bit about our history. And embedded in my PowerPoint, I have videos, which um, I'm not gonna show all the videos. I have just very small links in there, but it's basically pertaining to the different slides that I have, um, different information, so if, at the end, we have time. We could watch some of them. Then I also have a video that I recorded myself while we were home from COVID. <laughs> uh, just different spots in your backyard, and I'll definitely be showing that one at the end. So a little bit about me first. Um, I have my bachelor's in science and bio biology, a BA in education, uh, my professional science master's in environmental studies, all from Stockton University. I also am an adjunct professor at Stockton University. I teach biodiversity and evolution and cells and molecules labs in addition to working here full time at the Mosquito Commission. I'm actually working on my doctorate in eco psychology and environmental humanities. Shout out if anybody's here. I told them I shared the link with them. <laughs> um, and I started off as a seasonal lab tech here at the Ocean County Mosquito Commission in 2014. Uh, after four years, I got promoted to full time ID specialist and I've been working full-time since 2018. A little bit about us, the Ocean County Mosquito Commission. Uh, we have a long history here in New Jersey. So we were actually started in 1913 to respond to the malaria epidemic. Uh, in, the early 1900, in the early 1900s, there were approximately 500 cases of malaria in New Jersey every year, which we eradicated uh, by about 1934, it dropped at about 10 cases and 1950s, it was believed to be completely eradicated. The only cases that we see now are travel related. We don't have any that come from mosquitoes that breed here. Um, the focus was put on modern day water management in the 1970s. This was after the banning of DDT and other harmful chemicals like that, which I think is a good shift that we made in the 1980s to more biological control methods. We employ about 14 full-time and about nine seasonal employees. Um, with COVID, the past few two years, we haven't really had seasonals, but we're back on track. So our give our guys a little bit of a break during the summer when it's, when it's crazy, but um, that's a little bit about our background. There's many different parts to mosquito control. So just a few of the things that we do uh, source reduction is our number one control method, which I'll talk about a few times in this talk. 
because basically what that means is removing water sources. Uh, mosquitoes need water to breed. So removing those sources is called source reduction. They aren't able to complete their lifestyle or their life cycle and their lifestyle <laughs> of feeding on us. Um, habitat manipulation is a lot of stuff we do in the winter. So we'll go and if there is a stream that's been blocked by like a beaver dam or down trees after a storm or anything like that, um, we'll go and we'll clean that up so that we'll get the water flowing again. Same thing with water management, biological control and pesticide applications. We make sure that we target the larval stage of the mosquito before they turn into adults. Um, we do everything with best practice research. So everything we try to do is as environmentally safe and environmentally conscious as possible. Um, we just recently got drone and, <laughs> and drone equipment, which we're, we're testing out to do detailed aerial photography. And we've been putting stuff in GIS mapping of our actual sites and um, where we treat. And we do that every year. For me in my office with all my plants, <laughs> um, I do mosquito identification. Uh, we take different samples for surveillance that we send out to Trenton to have tested for different diseases. And then we track every year the population of different species. Um, parity, which is how many times they've laid eggs in a season. So we like to see when we collect mosquitoes, how many times they have had a clutch of eggs because the more times they have eggs, um, the more chance there is of them spreading disease um, with the with the viral testing we also do. And then we submit the public health data for the CDC. And hopefully we already have signed up for some, but we love doing our public education and community outreach where we go around to different events like the Osh County Fair and things like that, where we have a table set up with information about mosquito control. Okay, so a little bit of history just to go back um, to, to further build on not just us, but mosquito control as a whole. So before switching to the focus of biological control methods, um, we have a New Jersey Mosquito Commission, which they're actually having their annual meeting this week, where um, we all get together and we talk about mosquito related things and research. And there's also the American Mosquito Control Association. So we try to stay on top of what the best practices are for biological control methods. But before that, um, pre-1980s, a lot of different harmful chemicals were used, unfortunately, in mosquito control, which helped with the reduction of malaria and basically getting rid of it in our area. Um, some of the controls that were used were DDT, which is very commonly known, um, malathion, proprox proproxor, lindane, there was the oil drip method where they would cover the surface of the water with oil in order to basically get rid of the oxygen and kill the mosquito larvae by, you know, suffocating them. And the black cigar of death, which I'll explain what that is. Um, DDT, when it was first experimented, it was showed amazing results. Um, the first experiments were in 1942. 1954, it was approved for civilian use. So basically you were able to buy DDT at the drugstore, wherever you needed it to go. You could just go and just buy DDT. Um, they used it in very large amounts, spraying from airplanes, out of backs of trucks. Um, they've used it in tree lines, waterways. But at that point, mosquitoes, because they are resilient little creatures, as we know, um, they were able to evolve that they developed a resistance to it. And we also started seeing the impact of it on our ecological habitats, such as the ospreys in our area, um, almost completely wiping them out by thinning out their eggs. It was banned in 1972 because finally, you know, the toxicity and the carcinogenic, carcinogenic concerns came to light that, hey, this might be causing cancer, it's causing all these ecological factors. And that's when we started our focus more on safer control methods. I have some pictures here of DDT use in the past, and you can see that they just sprayed it everywhere, anytime on anyone. <laughs> they had no filter when it came to DDT, unfortunately. Um, the Black Cigars of Death, this was pre-DDT time. So in 1909, they basically paid workers extra, which was explo exploiting, you know, low, low wage workers to pay them extra to smoke cigars made of tobacco mixed with 
chemicals and petroleum tar. So the fumes from their cigars would keep the mosquitoes away. So the people that lived in these mansions and these, you know, crops and these big fields and all that stuff were not harmed by the mosquitoes, but then everybody that was using the cigars eventually died from lung cancer because they were smoking straight chemicals. Um, it was estimated that one smoker died from lung cancer for every 5 billion mosquitoes killed. If you want to put it into perspective, quality of life, how we quantify somebody's life. Um, they thought that that was worth it at that time, just to keep those mosquitoes away. In 1976, the EPA implemented the Toxic Substances Control Act, which basically made us do our switch from, you know, chemical practices to warm water management. And that's actually a picture from our, our archives of our mosquito control workers from back in the day. We found a whole bunch of little, um, like, slides that we scanned into the computer. So a lot of the pictures that I have, their older pictures are actually pictures from our mosquito control from in the past. So it's really neat. Um, and then they made their primary control source production, which is still proven most effective um, form of control to this day. Here's one of our first airplanes that we used. They're loading in granular, which is um, used as a bacterial agent to put in the water that targets mosquito larvae that kills mosquitoes. We still use that kind of uh, treatment today. And then here's some of our water management practices from back in the day. Um, we basically tried to create areas in the marsh where water was able to escape during tides so that it wouldn't pool and it wouldn't allow for the stagnant water to stand for the mosquitoes to breed. Um, the picture in the middle on the bottom is the way that we used to count mosquitoes because there were so many of them. They would ride in, it's a truck trap, it's called. It was either on the top of a truck or on a boat, as you see there. And it would just catch the mosquitoes as they were riding the boat down the river or down the inlet, down the tributary, whatever it may be. And thousands and thousands and thousands of mosquitoes. And then they would sort through them and do population studies on them that way. Really interesting. Here's some more images of our old, and like I said, these are all from the Ocean County Mosquito Commission. So <laughs> a little taste of history here from a blast to our past. And then these are a little bit more recent. So moving on now to actually mosquitoes. What makes a mosquito a mosquito? We get calls a lot of times, especially during the season, in the beginning of the season, the summer, and the end of the season, the summer, when crane flies come out. Um, we get calls of people saying, I've seen the biggest mosquito I've ever seen in my life. I don't know where they're coming from. And it's usually most likely a crane fly. Um, or in the beginning of the summer, we get the noceums, the little tiny gnats that they, they just love pinching your skin. And they're not trying to, to bite you, but they just love pinching you. But since they are biting you, people confuse them with mosquitoes a lot. Um, basically, the way to tell a mosquito diff a separate from other insects is that they have the proboscis, which is the, the long funnel that comes out the front that they use to take a blood meal from you. Um, they're usually confused basically with anything that's flying in your face, I think, because everybody just doesn't want it to be a mosquito. Uh, they're interesting because they can fly up down, sideways, and backwards. So that's why when you try to give them a nice little smack, it always seems like you never catch them. Just the wind from your hands coming together is enough to just push them away because they just basically float. I always say they're the smartest, dumbest animals on the planet because they just float around and get the job done, what they need to do to survive. Uh, here's a little info so you could see the proboscis on the mosquito. So what you're looking for when you're looking for mosquitoes is that that feeding tube on the front of it. And on the side are some things that they're commonly mistaken for, especially the crane fly, the gnats and the midges, because the midges look a lot like mosquitoes. I've actually been like, oh, that's a mosquito already in the beginning of the year, like it's springtime. And then I notice, no, it's not. It's a midge. And I and I get confused because they do look a lot alike. The male mosquitoes have those fuzzy antenna, so they're commonly mistaken for midges. But what you want to look for is the proboscis on the front 
and when they land, they put their back legs lifted up. So if you ever see a mosquito land on you to, to take a blood meal, you'll notice that their legs are lifted up in the back. Here's some size comparisons. So you can see the difference, uh, a crane fly to the size of a mosquito. So uh, Culex pipiens, the one they use in the image on the left is about a medium sized mosquito. We do have some that are larger and we do have some that are smaller, but in terms of the size of a crane fly, we don't have any mosquitoes that are as large as a crane fly. I actually have on the side, I'll show at the end, um, the largest mosquito that we do have in Ocean County. I'll put it in my hand to get a size comparison of it so you can see the actual size of it in, in real life. And the image on the right um, is a midge, which is about the size of like the noceums that we get in the beginning of the summer um, compared to, again, another Culex mosquito, which is like an average size mosquito. So you can see how much smaller it is. The mosquitoes that we do have that are small in size do not feed on humans. Um, they're called Saffirina and they feed on frogs and they're actually pretty beautiful. So, but we, we wouldn't see them taking a blood meal from us. So if you see something that small, it's not a mosquito either. A little anatomy of a mosquito. So all arthropods are made up of the three body segment with the head, the thorax and the abdomen. Um, a little bit more detail on the, the image on the right. So when I'm identifying mosquitoes in the lab, I use more of the identification key of the image on the right because I look at the stripes on the legs, um, the, the, if it has spots on its femur, different patterns in its wings. I look down the back of its abdomen, if it has stripes, no stripes, if it's blunt, if it's sharp, pointed. Um, the antenna, if they're fuzzy, they're male, if they're not, they're female. Um, and then even the proboscis can have different characteristics to it as well. So there's many different ways to identify different mosquitoes. Here's a closer image of an actual mosquito. I thought this was a beautiful image that you can see. It's the one from the, the first picture, but just larger. Um, the proboscis on the front of it with the legs up in the back of it. We have three most common kinds of mosquitoes here in Ocean County. Um, Aedes, Culex, and Anopheles. Um, Aedes, they have the pointed abdomen. They're mostly associated with flood water because they like to lay their eggs in mud and dirt right above the water line. So they become our biggest nuisance mosquito because it's whenever we get a rain or like a coastal event, a tropical storm, something that will make the water level go up. They, all the eggs will basically become submerged at the same time and then hatch all at the same time. Uh, Culex, they're mostly bird biters, but they are the major vector of West Nile virus transmission. So when we test, we usually come up with them being the ones that are uh, positive for West Nile virus. But then we take a look at the population because there are other mosquitoes that can transfer it from animals, different animals to humans. And I'll go over that more in the end. Anopheles. Um, that's the malaria mosquito, but we don't have the species that currently transmits malaria here. So no worries that we have it here. Uh, they're actually, I think they're beautiful mosquitoes. They have just very different looking bodies and different characteristics as opposed to the other two. So I feel like if you saw one of them, you'd be like, this is a weird looking mosquito, but it's definitely a mosquito. Um, and then less, uh, less common, we have Culicida, which is our very large mosquitoes, which I'll show you in the end. Seraphora, I mean, uh, Seraphora is the very large one, I'm so sorry. Seraphora is the very large mosquito, I'll show you in the end. And then Cochlectidia, which actually funnels into reed plants. So their larvae is a little different the way we, we combat them as opposed to other ones because they get their oxygen from a saw-like tube that they stick into plants when they're larvae. Um, so when we when we try to tackle them or try to find them, it's actually rather difficult because they're not floating on the top of the water like the rest of the mosquito larvae. So the life cycle of mosquitoes, first they start off as eggs. Um, if they're the 80s, like I said, they, they lay them one by one above, right above the water line. So whenever the water 
uh, rises up a little bit, they go and they get activated, they turn into larvae. The culex lay them in rafts that float on the top of the water. So they're constantly basically breeding culex. We don't need a large event for culex to, to breed. Um, once they turn to larvae, there's different life cycles for instars that they go through for stages before they turn into a pupa. Pupa look like little shrimp basically, but they kind of hang out at the top of the water. And then from that, they go to adult. Depending on the temperature, um, it could take five to 10 days when it's hotter outside, like in the in the peak of summer. Um, that's why I'll, I'll talk about one of our biggest nuisance mosquitoes and they, the fact that they breed so fast is one of the things that's contributing to why we can't get rid of them. In May, beginning of June, when it's a little cooler, still out at night, they don't breed, they don't go through the cycle as quickly. It's only when it, it's really hot, so. Um, the eggs itself, so the eggs on the left are the 80s, so those are the single ones. The one on the right, those are the, the Culex, they, they sit as a raft. Um, some eggs can stay dry for up to 10 years or more. So when we had Hurricane Sandy, there were eggs that were probably sitting in the mud just waiting for that those floods to come in order to activate them. Um, yeah, and you could basically find mosquitoes in uh, mosquito eggs in any kind of water that's standing water, as small as a bottle cap to as big as a tidal pool um, or, you know, a block stream or, or things like that. Here's some pictures of the Culex egg raft. I have this wonderful, beautiful microscope here that I can hook up to the computer. So I have also the, the image on the left is a video. So I could show at the end if we have time as well. Um, we somebody found the egg raft, which as you see on the finger, it's very, very small when you find these egg rafts. Um, but we, we got video of the larvae coming out of the eggs. So that's the image on the left. Um, the image all the way on the right is just a closer zoomed in view of those eggs. Um, and then the finger, of course, you can see the size of how small they are. So if sometimes if you feel like you find a mosquito egg and it's not that itty bitty teeny tiny, because remember that raft is made up to, of all the pieces that you see on the left, it's probably not a mosquito egg. It's probably an egg from something else that lays in water. Um, dragonflies are also aquatic. Mayflies are aquatic in, in their early stages. So it could be eggs from another critter. Um, the larvae. They go through four stages. So this is when you will see them the most present in standing water. This is when you want to get them. <laughs> uh, the best way to do is just dump out the water. That's the source reduction. That's what we, you know, get rid of the standing water, get rid of the mosquitoes. They have an air tube that helps them breathe. It's the respiratory siphon and they don't breathe underwater. So they need to go to the top of the water surface in order to breathe. So when you do have something that's sitting out collecting water, you will see them because they'll all be at the top. And if you give it a nice tap, whatever the container may be, they start, we call them the wigglers because they start going all crazy throughout the water and then they'll slowly float back up to the top so they can breathe again. Um, if it's any kind of moving water, we get, asked all the time, like, what about my pond? What about my pool? If there's a filter and the water is moving, it's fine. If it's unmanaged and not taken care of and the water's stagnant, that's where you'll find them. So um, like a garbage can that you left the lid off of, or uh, like, like I said, like a pool that's not managed, tarps, different things. I'll go over more of them as well. The pupae, this is the final stage of mosquito development. Uh, this is the fastest stage. So they go from larvae through the four instars to pupae and then pupae to adult pretty quick. We can, we've actually seen, looked in a, we keep them in um, these little, they bring them back to me in these little containers. Um, and then I try to identify them and I've looked at it before and I've seen a pupae in it. And then like an hour later, I looked and it was a mosquito. So this stage of development is, especially when it's warmer, it can be really, really fast. They still breathe from the top of the water, so you'll still be able to see them. Um, and still removing them from water at this stage will get rid of them. So you can get rid of them with source reduction at this point. It's just that they do uh, change into adults pretty quick once they get from here. 
And then adults, we have over 40 different mosquito species in Ocean County. These are just some common ones. Uh, I like to put these up because you can see the variations in the way that they look. Um, there are, you know, some ways that they look similar, but there are very distinctive ways that they are different. So we can, for the most part, tell every mosquito. We do have some questions, sometimes some weird ones that <laughs> come up, but some of them are very, very distinctive. Um, we There's some that we don't see year after year after year, and then they'll pop up every once in a while. So it's not like there's 40 different kinds flying around at all times. Uh, we do have our common ones, which you see here, and there's a few others. But yeah, these are some of our little pesky guys, or ladies, I should say, because only females would be. Our biggest nuisance at the moment is Aedes albopictus, and I can guarantee if you remember 20 so years ago, you never remembered seeing them and now you see them everywhere. So this was an image um, from the CDC from 2016 of their distribution. I couldn't find a more recent one from the CDC, but I can guarantee you now that the, the map has extended. Uh, especially with our warmer winters, these mosquitoes require 30 days below freezing uh, before the eggs to die and not be able to hatch the following season. They overwinter and we haven't had that. We'll have like a day or two or maybe like less than a week below freezing, but it has to stay below freezing. Like that's daytime temperatures as well. Um, so as it keeps getting you know warmer with climate change, we're going to start seeing them spread further north. They are invasive, and the issue with them is that they can breed in basically any kind of artificial container. Like I mentioned earlier, water bottle cap. They love garbage, um, and they love finding like that one upside down flipped frisbee in your yard that you forgot about that's under a bush and you don't even know it's there. And once they have success in a location, it seems like they just always know where to go back to. The smartest, dumbest animals, I swear. Um, they have a symbiotic relationship with humans because we are their driving force in their reproduction. They wouldn't be able to reproduce without us because they are an urban mosquito. Um, we call them the backyard breeder. Uh, they came over from a single egg rack in a tire um, from Asia. It seems to be our, our problem with invasive species. They seem to thrive here when coming from that climate over to here to our climate. Uh, and they were first seen in New Jersey in 1995, very sparse, sparse, and then just recently their population exploded. I feel like I can't go outside at all in the summer without seeing them. Um, the issue with them, unfortunately, is that our treatment methods with the Mosquito Commission, we can't go into everybody's yard. We do offer a program where we, I don't know if we're doing it this year because of COVID, but um, we would, I think we're doing it last year too, but if you have an issue with mosquitoes, we could come check out the yard and see if there's any source that you missed that might be breeding or anything like that. Um, just because they do find those little areas. And I always tell people, if you have them, it's you or your neighbors. They only travel about an eighth of a mile from where they breed because they do have such resilience in the spots that they do breed in. So they don't travel very far. So, if you have them in your yard, it's most likely you or the people around you. Some breeding habitats of mosquitoes. So in addition to um, artificial containers and things like that in your yard, if you have clogged gutters or bird baths or those corrugated drain pipes, um, anything that can hold water for a consistent amount of days will breed mosquitoes. That also includes any kind of like puddling in a yard um, the marsh, as you see, there's a tidal pool there, tree holes. We go to um, basins, storm drains, and you know, we, we have a, a list that we go through where we check different sites every single day throughout the summer um, to treat them as needed. What eats mosquitoes? So there's a, a nice list, bats, birds, bacteria, lizards, spiders, and that's actually a spider eating a mosquito. I didn't notice it at first when I first saw it. I was like, oh, wait, that's perfect. Um, fish, which we actually do implement control with fish as well and other insects. What we do for our surveillance, we do different types of mosquito trapping. Um, we use basically four primary different types of traps. 
and three of them we use as traps to collect fresh samples that we instantly put onto ice to send out to be tested for viruses. And then one trap that gets sent back to me, which I then identify them for our population studies. So the first trap is a gravid trap. So it has stinky, stinky water in the bottom of it that mosquitoes are drawn to um, to basically lay their eggs because they want to lay their eggs in the standing water. So a lot of the mosquitoes that we pick up in this trap are mosquitoes that have already taken a blood meal, which is great to see if they do have a viral component to them um, because it has blood fed. And a lot of the mosquitoes that we do pick up in these traps are the Culex mosquitoes, the, the bird biters. We run them overnight and then we collect them in the morning, um, put them right onto ice so that they stay fresh and, and sent out for testing each week. CDC traps. We use a lure of CO2 and light. So CO2 is the chemical that we emit that they're most drawn to for us. So this usually traps mosquitoes that are looking for a blood meal um, because they think that they are smelling basically our gases. So they go into this and that's a good way to see if they've already had a blood meal and now they're looking for another one. It might be a bridge vector, which is a mosquito that bites humans and birds, which might transfer West Nile over um, or other diseases over to us. Um, we usually catch a lot of mosquitoes that bite humans in these traps because we do use that CO2 um, lure with it and other mammals as well. And it's the same thing. It's usually set up right by the gravid trap and set at night and collected in the morning. Light traps, this is what I have sent here. So we have 28 different traps in the county. Um, we catch a wide variety of different mosquitoes in this trap because we have it set up where it's running at 24 or 24 seven. Um, there's a little fan on the top with a light that tracks them in. We have two different runs, north and south, um, in all different locations from east to west, all across Ocean County. So it gives us a good idea of the different species and the different populations that we're looking at. If there are areas of concern, uh, we know where to go and where to look to see if there's anything going on. We'll set up those other traps and test for viruses, or we'll try to find maybe there's um, standing water somewhere that we missed that's not on our route that we haven't checked. Um, or after storms, like it's a good indicator of uh, if we have a coastal storm, we have a lot of traps set up on the coast. If there was a big brood of our, our salt marsh mosquito that comes out of that. So this is one of our indicators of our population to help engage with our uh, control methods. And then finally, these are newer traps. We acquired these when Zika came in the spotlight uh, back when we had the Zika scare. We, we don't have the mosquito here that transmits Zika virus. Um, the cases that we had here were all travel related or it's also a sexually transmitted disease, unfortunately, um, but we did not have any locally transmitted cases here. The only ones in the United States locally transmitted were in Florida and Texas. So it wasn't really much of a concern, but we acquired these traps and they have a lure that smells, it's, suppo it's supposed to mimic <laughs> the smell of humans. It's terrible. I think I literally, it's the worst thing I've ever smelled in my life. I don't know if that's really what they think we smell like, but it's, it's bad. I can't even explain it. Um, it does okay. And it mostly catches the 80s albopictus, the, the Asian tiger mosquito. So it's a good indicator of what's going on in like a backyard setting. So we'll set these up in people's houses and their backyards. Um, any kind of residential, we'll, we go behind like shopping plazas and things like that to see if there are larger populations of Aedes albopictus. And the same thing with these, they're set and then collected the next morning and put right on ice. So what we do now after we analyze our population um, from doing our trapping and getting our population studies of our mosquitoes, um, we basically do population management. So we do folk try to focus on larviciding um, so this is an insecticide that targets the larval stage. So it's applied to water, the water sources. BTI is what we use. It's a bacterium found in soil and 
it's cut off, but it says that effectively kills mosquito larvae. Um, it's Bacillus thuringiensis. I always try to say it, I can't say it. Um, I do this with my students all the time too. It is a naturally occurring soil bacterium, and it only targets mosquito larvae and midges and larvae of that size. So it's perfectly safe for fish, for plants. Um, they say it's safe for humans too. They're not that you should take a handful and eat it because <laughs> it probably wouldn't feel so good on your stomach, but it's not something that is toxic. Um, adult deciding is our last effort that we do for chemical treatments if there's an issue with adult mosquitoes. So our population management that we do, um, that you'll see us all summer scooting about Ocean County, our ground larva siding crew is the guys in the trucks and they go around and do the basins and different treatment areas and the storm drains and target, they have different zones, the red zones as well, that they have a list in every single township in, in the whole county that they go through. Aerial larva siding, we have two helicopters and the guys go out and they, they check the marsh. And then we do our community outreach and water management. So these are what our trucks look like. So they do the different zones every week, visited by our inspectors. Um, if the site's breeding, then they'll treat the area. If it's not, they don't treat it. There's no reason to treat something that doesn't have mosquito larvae. A lot of times spots I'll go to will be dried up if we're in drought, um, or if it's something that the water's moving, you know, we don't, we don't, we just let it be. We don't treat those areas. Uh, here's our aero larva sighting. So this is one of our helicopters. So what they do is they have a liquid spray and they have a granular spray. So the granular spray is great where the liquid get would get stuck in like tree lines or big uh, fields of phragmites, things like that, that we need it to penetrate through to get to, to the water source. Um, and then you'll see our guys, the picture up there is Joe and he's inspecting um, a, a flooded part of the marsh to see if there's mosquito larvae with it. And then we keep all the data from this. And I actually have uh, my boss compiled this. So we wanted to look at evidence of sea level change after Superstorm Sandy. So we have this from, um, I'm pretty sure it's by Caddis. I had, it, I had it marked in the other one and I took it off. I'm pretty sure this is up by Caddis Island. So to give you an idea, um, the larval treatment zones are where we checked for mosquito larvae and they were present. And then we had to treat them with the helicopters. Um, so from 2001 to 2009, this was the treatment zone. So this is where we had to actually treat. And we have not done marsh management in this area since then. So this is all just from tidal change. And then 2010 through 2018, this is now the treatment zone of where we needed to treat for larvae breeding. Just in 2019 and 2020, it changed to this as being the area of larvae treatment. And then just last year, it changed again, that it changed to that. So you could see in, in comparison to sea level rise, um, it's, it's creeping in. So this is all where there would be larvae present in standing water before it basically encompassed the whole marsh. And now it's just deeper and deeper in. Um, a little scary, but that's what it is. Uh, one of our other treatments that we do or biological control methods that we do is fish stocking. So if we have um, abandoned properties that we had a lot during Sandy um, or you know different areas like basins, water basins, catch basins, or ponds at like communities and things like that, we'll put either fathead minnows or gambusia in uh, to basically eat mosquito larvae so we don't have to keep going back and treating it. Even if you have your own pond, um, if you get the fathead minnows there, or any kind of guppy type fish, they'll eat the mosquito larvae. Goldfish will eat them as well. So if you have fish in a pond, they're pretty good and resilient at eating the mosquito larvae. Uh, marsh management was one of our first moves towards uh, bi uh, biological control, um, not using chemicals. So we use open marsh water, open marsh water management. Um, it's basically the practice of creating pools uh, in replace of the ditches that were popular in the early 1900s. 
because now fish are able to live in there. There's less mosquito habitat. Um, the tidal flow is able to go in and out, so it's not stagnant. So we created different pathways to allow for the tide to come in. And then also, so we know where specific treatment sites are, so we can go to them in the helicopters and check them. And then um, adult deciding is really used only in extreme cases. We try everything we can do to not have to use this control method. But if there is a large amount of positive virus pools in an area, we will only target the very specific area in which we find it. We don't like spray the whole county. There are some townships that still do spray. We're not affiliated with them. Um, that's all for the township. But when, when we do it, uh, we send out a notice. It's on our website. We call the beekeepers. So if you are a beekeeper and you're not registered with the DEP, please, please, please do it because <laughs> we have the updated list and, and we always get worried that we forget people um, if we go out and do this. Um, you get real-time data from Rutgers Center for Vector Biology. If you go under the surveillance tab, you can find the actual information for um, the virus, uh, how many cases there are and things like that. And then that's the Seraphora ciliata, so that is our largest mosquito. So um, the flooding from Hurricane Florence, I don't know if anybody remembered a few years ago, people were basically running to their cars to dive bomb these mosquitoes because the storm flooded a whole bunch of breeding habitat and breeding sites for them. We have them every year. Uh, we seem to find them more out by like Plumstead, um, Jackson, horse farm areas, uh, different farm areas because they like to breed in like flooded pastures. So they're not really a coastal mosquito, they're more of an inland mosquito. So we, we do have them here, they're not as common, but you can see they're on the first person's fingertip, they're still not as large as a crane fly. And I will show a real one in the end. Uh, so human attraction, mosquitoes are attracted to all different things. Um, everybody thinks it's the blood type, uh, it's one factor in it. Mostly they're attracted to the carbon dioxide that we breathe and the amount of lactic acid that we produce from our skin. So basically the stinkier we are, the more attractive they are to us. Um, everybody has a different expel of natural skin oils. Uh, everybody has a different body temperature and then blood type does play a factor into it. I know I'm blood type A positive and they say O is the one that's most loved by mosquitoes, but mosquitoes love me. So I always wonder if it's because I'm like a mouth breather <laughs> or I'm stinky or something because I have A positive blood. Um, but they're just attracted to smells and gases. They have hundreds of re different receptors on their antenna. Do you have a question? So I want to know if I'm stinky. No. <laughs> um, they have hundreds I'm an A plus. Of I'm A plus too. That's what I just okay. wanted to <laughs> Do mosquitoes yes. love you too? Oh my goodness. Yes. So, so we must we'll stop there. Yep. <laughs> but <laughs> I think they just love everybody. There's some people that are just lucky. I think that's what it is. It comes down to luck. Um, but yeah, they have they have tons of different receptors on their antenna. So just picking up all different chemicals coming from our bodies. They tend to like our feet and our legs more. There was an idea that maybe it's because we have more bacteria, like our feet are stinkier or something along those lines, but I think it's, we're less likely to notice that they're there. And also a lot of the times they rest in grass. They don't breed in grass. A lot of people find them in the grass, but that's really where they're just resting to keep out of the sun when it's a hot day. So that's their closest point of impact. They always get the back of my legs, even through my pants. They'll get me the whole back of my legs will be torn up. So when I'm wearing shoes, so I don't think it's just stinky feet, but they love, yeah, they love me. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, mosquitoes are the deadliest animals in the world. This number's higher now. Um, I believe last year it was a million. So it's crazy. Um, the malaria vaccine is groundbreaking, especially for, you know, the countries that carry malaria um, still. Fortunately, we don't have it here. And fortunately, our numbers are not anywhere close to this. <laughs> but because of... Um, yellow fever, malaria, 
dengue, and I'll go over a few of those as well. They are the world's deadliest animal. And I feel like our human number is going to go up too. But this is an older graphic. This was probably from 2018. Um, malaria. So it's uh, caused by a plasmodium parasite. So it's not actually caused by a virus. It's spread by the Anopheles mosquito. In 2015, there are 212 million malaria cases. So there aren't, it's not 100% death rate for malaria um, because there is a way to build up immunity to it because in these places where it's being spread and there are a lot of mosquitoes, it's basically being transmitted over and over. Um, it just depends on how bad the parasite infects your body and how much of an impact it has with comorbidities and things of that nature. Um, so early diagnosis and prompt treatment helps prevent deaths. And hopefully now with the new vaccine that's in, in its working stages will also help with malaria. Um, our primary focus here in uh, Ocean County is West Nile virus. Uh, first appeared in the United States in 1999. So it doesn't have a long running history. Um, there, in the U.S., there's average about 2,000 to 3,000 average human cases a year and 110 deaths, but that's on average. Um, we start our surveillance here very beginning of May. We start trapping and with those traps that I showed in before, and we run it all the way through November. We usually don't see in the beginning of the summer because the more blood meals a mosquito takes, the more common it is to transmit it. 75% of people infected show fewer no symptoms. Um, we have a theory that we may actually have been exposed to it, but this is just the theory. This is just my personal thought. And you know, our body built up antibodies to it. There's no research on that, but just Jessica toiling things around in my head. <laughs> um, the severe symptoms include fever, headache, vomiting, rash, encephalitis, meningitis, and then of course, unfortunately, death. Uh, very rare that we have here is Eastern equine encephalitis. So this is another one we test for. Um, it causes encephalitis in the brain, high fever, muscle pain, altered state, headaches, seizures. Most of the time, if you do get triple A, um, it is once you pass a certain point, there's no way to treat it. Yellow fever, dengue, and oh, I know it's going to click off of it. And other. <laughs> The screen is blocking it. Um, there's only a few cases reported in Ocean County, and they're usually travel related, like I said, with Zika, and it's from people visiting tropical, uh, warmer climates. We do test Aedes albopictus, but they don't seem to have a good transmission rate of anything. So even if they do come up positive, um, there's research being done on the Wolbachia bacteria to see if that maybe impacts their ability to transmit the virus. Um, but that's very detailed. I just realized we're running out of time, so I wanted to go through um, other diseases. We have chikungunya and Zika. Um, not really a concern. They're mostly travel related. So what can you do to help? This is my video, so I'll show this at the end. So the motto, um, tip, toss, and then protect yourself. I did. Did my video just pop up? Did on my computer. Just trying to mess me up. <laughs> so tip, toss, and protect. So tip any stagnant water, any unused containers, like I said, even just a water bottle cap, the smallest things, um, get rid of them. If you don't need them, get rid of them. Or uh, if it's a garbage can, like you collect your sticks in, like I have in my backyard, I drilled holes in the bottom of it so that the water is always draining out of it. And then protect with mosquito repellent. So we always say to use, you know, what is best application by the EPA. And um, there are natural ones that are approved. Lemon of eucalyptus oil, I think Repel is the brand that has it. Um, I get one from uh, a, like a local type of place, I believe this Myers is another brand that has it. I think that's the brand that uses it. So. There are ones that are approved for mosquito repellent. I do not suggest rubbing garlic on yourself or a lemon or things like that because it's not it's not going to help as well as repellent does. 
um, source reduction, like I spoke about in the beginning. So there's a number of ways to remove the mosquitoes by removing their water source. They can't complete their life cycle. Um, the biggest one that we see now is these corrugated drain pipes that we stick out so we don't have the pooling around our drains uh, from our gutters. But if you cut holes in it, like in the picture there, the water won't be able to sit and you want it to do it in the little divots, like the little divots. So where that actually the water is stuck in, where it's worse, where the cuts are put in, it's not in the right spot. I just wanted to show that because the water is going to hold in the little lips at the bottom of it. And like the albopictus only that tiny bit of water and they'll know it's there and they'll always fly and they'll lay their eggs there and just wait for a rain to come and fill up those little patches and those corrugated drain pipes. Um, bird baths are another one, but they have solar powered water circulators. So you don't have to be dumping it out every day and making sure that it clean, you clean it out, even though the birds would love that if you did that. But um, some other things, uh, flower pots, which I'll show in the video, because you don't think about the dish that's under the flower pot, clogged gutters, make sure that you check them. Uh, uncovered boats, even if it's like a kayak or a canoe that's just sitting out for a few days, you know, like I said, it takes sometimes four or five days for mosquitoes to breed. So if you go out every weekend and sit and hold in water, it could just take that amount of time. Kids' toys like Frisbees, those sandboxes, if you take the lid off and leave the lid off. Uh, if you have cats that you give water to, just make sure you change the water out every day. And then anything else that could be laying around the yard. These are a list of plants that are said to repel mosquitoes. There's no actual research that has been done, but because of the overwhelming smell that these plants produce, they say that they work well by masking your smell so that the mosquitoes can't smell you, but there's so much more to it than just the way you smell, like the gases I said that we emit. So this can help in a way. Uh, they say to put it as like a barrier, but it doesn't eliminate them from your art. It's just something that can help. And I put a little star next to species that are invasive or fast spreaders. So you don't want, you know, to plant some catnip and then your whole yard's catnip. <laughs> um, so they say with those, maybe put them in containers um, or raised, raised garden beds or things like that if you wanted to plant them. But that's just a, a nice list of some natural things to put in. And, you know, some of these have multiple purposes. Uh, like I love lavender. I have dried lavender right next to me on my desk. Love, 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 love my marigolds. You know, they're just, so there's no harm <laughs> in putting in things that you like. This is a trap that I wanted to tell you. This, it's short lived. It's kind of like what we use for our CDC trap. Um, I don't know why it says brown sugar. Oh no, with the yeast. I, I was like, where's the yeast? So if you're having a party or a whole bunch of people over in your backyard and you want to get rid of mosquitoes, kind of keep them away from you real quick, this is an environmentally friendly way to kind of like lure them away from you. So when you put the activated yeast in the warm water and you cut the funnel of the bottle and put it in, when the yeast is going through the chemical process, it emits CO2, which is what the mosquitoes are attracted to. And since it's in such a confined space, it's hopefully going to draw them to this little trap where they're going to fly in and they're not going to be able to fly back out the top of the bottle the way it is in there. And it could work with anything that produces CO2 uh, activated yeast because in the warm water, when you shake it up, it tends to have a longer reaction time. It's good for like a barbecue to pop it like the fence in the far back corner of the yard to try to get them away. And that's my end. And I do, I want to show that video, so I don't know how to. Okay. Do you want to take, um, uh, you want to do the video now and then we'll do questions? Sure. Yeah, the video is. Um... Yeah, if you have it brought up on your computer, then you can hit the share button again and reshare your screen. On the screen. Oh, I have both screens. Oh, yep, not the PowerPoint one. <laughs> Otherwise, if you have the link, we might be able to. Uh... Yeah, I embedded it, so I figured. The ID specialist at the Ocean County Mosquito Commission. Um, I'm going to take you around my yard and show you some spots that might cause trouble this upcoming breeding season. 
First, to identify areas that are breeding, you should know what mosquito larvae look like. These are mosquito larvae, they look like little worms or wigglers. The number one preventative action you can take against breeding mosquitoes is source reduction to remove any standing water in your yard. Planters are notorious for breeding mosquitoes. This look here collects water, mosquitoes will lay their eggs, even in something like this, if the mosquito can fly in, they will lay their eggs in the standing water. Search the yard for hidden toys that might be laying around collecting water. Flipping over any tools in the yard will definitely help, but make sure there's not other places on them collecting water. The water collecting in this lid can breed thousands of mosquitoes a season. This is an unconventional and often overlooked type of breeding location. And of course, make sure to take care of your pools. Bye. <laughs> that wasn't my pool. I wish that was my pool. I was sure about how bad I want a pool. <laughs> Well, well, it's because they you presented everything. We had so many questions, but you wound up tagging them all as we went through just about, except for the last one. And I'll let Patty go ahead and, um, if you would like to ask that one. Um, the last question that came in said, "There's large drain areas between their townhome complex that constantly hold water and they don't drain well. What can be done in this case?" Um, in that case. We might already be treating them. So our ground larviciding crew, usually if it's with townhomes or condos or apartments, like we're aware of those places, but the best thing to do would be to just give us a call and then we could double check to make sure that it is on our list. And if it's not, we'll send somebody out to check it out to see if it can be put on our list. And then in that case, we come, it's either every week or every two weeks that we do our rounds through every township that it would be checked for larvae and then treated with the BTI if it needed to be treated with the larva siding. Okay, and uh, um, there's, oh, go ahead, Pat. Another one came in. Uh, do year round or poorly designed stormwater detention basins breed mosquitoes? They do, yes. So, uh, like I said, the same thing, we, we have a list that we go to there are mosquitoes in those basins if they have basically like a tunneling that keeps the temperature a little bit warmer. So if it is a drainage basin that has, you know, the long tunnel that goes out to say it drains out to a different area of the water treatment or to a different source, under the ground it usually stays warmer. The mosquitoes that we find in there usually are Culex mosquitoes. So they're the ones that are bird biters, not human biters. Um, but basically every type of mosquito either overwinters as larvae or overwinters as eggs. So even in other breeding areas, if they lay the eggs throughout the winter, they'll survive until the next breeding season. Yeah. I do have one. Um, a couple of people have asked it, uh, throughout the Q&A is um, about the beneficial things that eat uh, the mosquitoes. Can you go over those again? Because somebody's asking about frogs and yeah, yeah. So basically any amphibian, so frogs, salamanders, uh, different reptiles will eat mosquitoes. Bats eat mosquitoes. Dragonflies are a big one that eat mosquitoes. Certain birds eat them as well. So there are a large variety of different animals and insect species that eat them. Um, when they're in the larval stage, other mosquitoes eat other mosquitoes. So there's actually, we have predatory larvae that eat other mosquito larvae. Um, yeah, dragonfly larvae will eat mosquito larvae, the fish will eat mosquito larvae, so it really goes from water to land. There are a variety of different things. Um, spiders, basically uh, any kind of insect eater, if it eats an insect, it'll eat a mosquito. And viruses can't be transmitted from actually eating the mosquito. Viruses can only be transmitted from the transmission of blood. Um, when they take a blood meal, because what they do is they expel the coagulating agent out first, which then releases the virus right into the bloodstream. Because when they take a blood meal, they find an artery. So it goes right into the bloodstream of the animal that they're feeding on. Yeah. Um, I thought there was a great question from Kathy, um, especially with anybody with uh, above ground pools um, with a cover on it now for the winter. Um, is the water still sitting on the top? When do they need to definitely remove that before the water, before mosquitoes? Just keep an eye on it. Um, they can, we'll start seeing our earliest mosquitoes when it starts 
you know, we have wintering mosquitoes. So we actually have snow pool mosquitoes and we have cold weather mosquitoes, but normally when it gets like 50 degrees, like around now, like what the weather we see now, we'll start seeing some of those colder season mosquitoes start popping up. Somebody brought me larvae back the other day that he broke through ice and he found them. Um, so if you keep an eye on it and what we use is basically, I'm sure I could have a, a coaster here. <laughs> it's about this size. the size and it's like a little bucket on a stick and we just scoop out the water if there's mosquito larvae in there they'll be in the little scoop so you can take a scoop or even like a kid's bucket or something and check to see if you scoop anything up yeah and see if they're in there if they're not in there then you should be fine yeah okay this time of year they take a long time to go through their cycle um, I see there was a question about self-watering planters, and I'm sure, yes, they could hold mosquitoes. If the mosquito can get in there and it's standing water, yep. it'll, yeah. it'll do it. Yeah, um, that's so why I showed the careful. one pot, because it looked like it was sealed, but there was that little tiny crack. And the albopictus, they're tiny. So if they see the opportunity to go in, yeah, especially with the self-waters, because they usually have that bigger hole that you yep. put the water in, yeah, they'll go in there and they'll lay their eggs in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Patty. Um, so I know you talked, there's just a question. Does the spraying kill the eggs and the larva? I know you kind of went over the spraying that you do kills the adults. Yeah. So the, the main treatment that we do is the larva siding. So it's usually the granular, um, or we do have the spray. It's actually like diluted into a liquid. Um, that's larva siding. That's targeting water sources that the larvae are in the spraying out of the trucks. The adult deciding will kill only the adults, but we only do it in extreme cases. And then I know certain townships like um, Stafford Township, they they have their own program, but that's separate from us. Okay. So they could check with their town if they if, mm -hmm. if there's anything specifically being done at a certain time, they could exactly. check with their they're, town in case they put it's up different. a schedule. Yeah, they put up a schedule. I know because I live in Mount Hawkins, so it's Stafford. Um, and mm -hmm. then you could actually go on a list where they won't spray by your house. So I don't know if it's the same in every township, but in Manahawk and Stafford Township, you could go on their no spray list and they do have a spray schedule. And then I know we do have a bunch of um, people that may not be from uh, Ocean County. Um, mm -hmm. do, does every county have a mosquito commission in New Jersey? Yes, every county has a mosquito commission in New Jersey. That's what our convention that's this week is the New Jersey Mosquito Control Association convention. It's down in Atlantic City. Um, we all get together and we all talk about mosquito related things. <laughs> and then every year we actually have an annual American mosquito control associated association meeting, um, where everybody across the whole country gets together because it's basically, we try to do best practices from research for mosquito control across the board. So not every county in every state has a mosquito control, um, type of, you know, thing like what we do here. But basically, every state has some kind of mosquito management. Um, we're really big. Uh, Massachusetts does a lot. New York does a lot. You know, down south, especially Florida, does a lot. California has a really big program. I actually, I'm a fan of one of their one of their counties. I, I they have like a mascot and everything, so I always be checking out their stuff. So, yeah, there's uh, in Colorado. I have a friend that lives there. I know Boulder County has a big program. So it is across the country as well as every county in the state. Well, and somebody did ask about what chemicals are used in aerial spraying, but including on the streets, but that depends on whether Ocean County is spraying it or if it's the township is having somebody come in. So you would need to check local just in case, because uh, I'm not sure where uh, Ed is and what town he's in. Um, but that would be, um, you know, check, check local first with your yeah. town and then they'll say, oh, the county handles that. So. If it's the if it's the truck like ours in Stafford comes around at like four a.m. If it's the truck at four a.m. with their lights flashing, it's not us. We're not up at four a.m. <laughs> but if it's something that's like in the afternoon, um, then it's us. Yeah, because we are seven to three thirty. Most of those, the the township they try to do it when other insects are resting or bees are in their hives. People aren't really out, so so that's when they do it. Um, Trips me out because no one's supposed to be here. Um, <laughs> with us, we're we're seven to three thirty, so that's usually when you'll see us active. 
and would um since i would you put up could you put up the ingredients again for the repelling um if you're doing it yourself which i know normally as wreckers we don't give the at home methods but i think that that was relatively um yeah the bottle with mix. the yeast with the yeast yeah, yeah. If, oh she's got low bandwidth so hold on a second <laughs> oh i don't see that oh uh, maybe it's on my end where you went um yeah the the yeast thing it's basically we actually even do it in my science lab can you see my powerpoint yeah yes we can see it now mm -hmm. Um, we do it in my science lab for one of my, my research projects too, for CO2 emission. We, we. Okay. It's so just slow. Yeah. It's coming up slowly, but surely. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, to test for CO2 emissions. So we do it. In that setting as well, and it's just because that is. 1 of the main things that they are attracted to. Is carbon dioxide. So that's what yeast emits when it's breaking down, when it's going through its fermentation process, because it's um, not aerobic respiration, it's anaerobic respiration for yeast. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so if you Googled um, mosquito yeast trap, you'll definitely be able to find, you know, a step by step guide how to do this. Uh, the sugar isn't necessary, it's added because it is kind of attractive. Like they, they, and mosquitoes are pollinators. So when we keep them here in house, when we do um, rearing of the eggs and doing research and keeping them, we usually just like stick an apple slice. We'll have like sugar water, things like that, because they are they are pollinators. Um, they don't eat blood. They they feed on on pollen. So the blood is just to help them make the females make eggs. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, um, yeah, Patty just, uh, I, you know, I, I don't, uh, there was a question in the chat um, uh, or Q&A about uh, what can you say about, you know, spraying private homes? And I know that's not really what we were targeting because we don't know, or you don't know, I'm assuming, you know, what private uh, companies are doing, you know, that have licenses, they need to have a license and stuff like that, but I yeah, don't know. They, they have pests, you know, we take the same pesticide applicator test um, whether or not it's implemented is really how they run their business and, you know, it's private owned. They, they're going to do what they can, what they're going to do. Um, I just know that just the chemicals that they do use are not weather resistant to put it in like a, a general way, because it is like a liquid spray. It's like, if you went to home Depot and just bought like cutter. The stuff that you put on your hose and spray that as soon as it rains, it washes into the soil, um, which, you know, we're, we're a major groundwater source for the Kirkwood Cohansey aquifer. So anything that goes through our soil enters our freshwater reserve, but, um, just with all that stuff, it's the unknown of. How it's resiliency lasts, what it lasts through. Um, if it's like a humid day, does the humidity, the moisture in the air, even make it seep into the soil, which, you know, mosquitoes don't breed in the soil. So that's not really getting rid of mosquitoes. Like I said, the best way to get rid of them is to target the water source because we know where they are. We know where they're breeding. And all you do is, you know, if you can tip it over um, or get some kind of treatment, if it's a, a bigger water source or call us to come check it out kind of situation mm -hmm. with, with those sprays, there's just too many variables that go into like I said, the, the resiliency of it and knowing if it is working. And it, and if you spray your yard and it's your neighbor's yard that's breeding the mosquitoes, you know, the mosquitoes aren't gonna be like, oh no, they sprayed, you know, they're still gonna come <laughs> to you. <laughs> they're not gonna, it's not like a jail that's gonna protect you from your next door neighbor's mosquito yard. So, yeah. And I know, and I, I appreciate that you're staying on a little longer because I know we're about 10 minutes over, but- um, no, that's fine, one yeah. Yeah, one last question from Kathy and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, can a residential person buy or use the BEG traps or the CDC trap for their own backyards to help maintain mosquito control? Is there a I'm sure that there there is a way, like we're we're a government agency, so everything that we do is through government outlets. But I'm I'm sure that there's a way to get them private in a private kind of way or even making it yourself. Because I know with greenheads um, in this area, because we're by the coast, 
there's a way to build uh, a trap for greenheads just with like a screen. It's on our website too, if anybody's interested in the greenhead trap. Um, but it's just basically like a screen and a piece of wood that's made into like a table and then something in the middle that attracts them and they're stupid and they can't fly out because they fly up into the screen. <laughs> but I'm sure there's something that you can make along the lines like we, for our CDC traps, we use dry ice because we make our dry ice with CO2. Yeah. So when it's, you know, throughout the day, it's slowly melting, it's releasing the gas. So if there's a way to get that, um, the BG traps, I know were a little pricey, but there might be a way to just get that that stick. <laughs> this thing stick smells <laughs> so bad. Um, or something that's similar to it, that's like a mosquito attractant. Um, mm -hmm. Anything with like essential oils or anything that's marketing with that kind of stuff, don't expect it to work. I mean, there are cases where like, we would love for everything to be cured with essential oils. Um, but like I said before, there are so many different factors that go into mosquitoes being attracted to a person that there's not just like one cure all that's going to keep them away. Even sometimes when I'm wearing repellent, I still get bit and I swear it's like the one little drop that I missed or, so, or something like that, or they just mm -hmm. don't even care because they love me so much. But yeah, unfortunately they're just too smart or too dumb. Well, I think it was great too, but most of the time those traps though are used for monitoring purposes for you guys. Is yeah. that correct? For us, That's what because they're for. we actually trap them and then we collect them and we test them. But like this trap that I have up here, it's the same thing basically as our CDC trap, but instead of using dry ice as a lure, it's using yeast, um, which is easier to just maintain and make and it's short lived and you know it does its job. So if it was a situation like that, that you did want to repeat, like kind of pull them away and keep them to the other side of the yard, I'm sure doing something like what we use for our trapping would work just the same because it's going to attract them to the trap. Mm -hmm. And of course, getting any rid of anything, whether it's, uh, you know, in assuming the adults, you, you know, they can't breed or they can't continue or they'll be in that trap and you can get rid of them. But still, that yeah. that can still be an issue. Exactly. Um, so. Uh, Jessica, I think it's great. We did have a question again about asking about the plants, but um, maybe we'll, we'll, when we send out the link, uh, we'll have a list of the plants. Oh yeah, you have it right there. Yeah, I had, um, I had it just on the next slide. I didn't time. realize it was on the next slide or I would have yeah, said yeah. something. Um, but we can send out the list too um, about that. And, yeah, this is um, also on our website. Um, there's a tab on our website that says, um, I want to say like natural, ways and of course there's the disclaimer at the top you know because we can't say for sure that these will work but there is evidence that they might help just because of you know eliminating the smell or like that trap attracting them to the yeast and and different things so there is a section on our website that i made um a section for more natural approaches if you wanted to try but they're not guaranteed mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, so if you, if you have any of your contact information right there, like where to call the uh, Ocean County Mosquito Control, I don't know if that was on your first or last slide. I think it was on the first slide. Oh my goodness. And unfortunately, with it being a, a Q and A, we can't just stuck it Sorry, in there. I'm trying to, do it. I'm trying to go so fast. Uh, no. Okay, uh, that's okay. All right, so, but that's what you're, you're going to look up Ocean County Mosquito Control. Should be, I think it's also in the government pages. Um, well, for those that have phone books still. Um, <laughs> yeah, <the> phone book. <laughs> I know. Sorry, I still have one for here. I live in Stafford too. So um, they always, uh, they but, always uh, yeah. give it. They always give it, but um, oh, I'm trying to stop. But, oh, you can look on yeah, you can look online. We're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat. So we want to appreciate <laughs> Ed. Um, that question I don't know if we can answer that. So I'm gonna leave that one uh go from there. Um but I, I do the uh, screen just, for oh, our there website. you go. Perfect. Can okay. you see my website? Yep. yep. Ocean County Mosquito Commission. Whoop. So contact, contact information. There it is in this. So you can take a screenshot or a picture with yep. your phone. Take a you picture with your phone. phone. Yeah, if you just <laughs> Google us, um, it comes right up. Our website comes right up. Um, I manage the Facebook page as well. I haven't been as active with the Facebook page because, you know, our season's the summer. So we're it's more active in the summer than the winter. Winter, we're doing our little projects and things. Um, yeah, if you go to more info, I have natural remedies here and like all different information. Oh, that's great. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, we have a contact form on here. So if you needed to get in contact, it, it gets sent right to me um, or anybody else. There's other emails listed. The OC Mosquito goes to um, just the general, like everybody. 
Yeah, so we'll send that information out with the link as well. Um, so we'll, we yeah. can have that contact if anybody needs to get uh, in contact. And then um, we'll see, because uh, there are, like I said, there are people from other counties as, in New Jersey. I don't know if anybody's out of state on this round, but um, we will definitely get the link out as soon as we can. Um, hopefully, uh, possibly by Friday, if not uh, Monday, uh, usually of the following week uh, is when we usually get them up and out. And Jessica, thank you so much again. This was great. Um, I was like a little, I was a little taken back by the Latin names, but they worked. Um, <laughs> And, and you were very consistent, so that worked. Um, but I was like, what? What kind of tick? You know, a tick, listen to me. Uh, it's mosquitoes, was it? So I, 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 I do. Uh, no, but it's good because it, you were consistent with the type that you were discussing. And it was, I think that that really helped. Yeah, so, we have just very, very common troublesome ones. So, you know, the albopictus, that is our, the tiger mosquito, that's our biggest nemesis right now because we it is to everybody's yard. And like, I wish we could, I wish there was a way to just do it. But like I said, source reduction and everybody just taking part and doing their own. We try to, when we do events, we try to make kids junior inspectors and we give them like a checklist of like things to check off in their yard with a little sticker. Like, <laughs> so we're trying, you know, to target because that's the biggest issue now is just, you know, when something invasive starts taking over, it just wreaks havoc as the next <laughs> talk about spotted lantern flies yes yes we'll discuss as yes well. we're gonna yeah. do and uh maybe we'll have to see if you're free in august we're doing a butterfly tent event uh this year again hopefully the weather will hold and uh maybe we can get to a little table or something like that if oh, you'd oh, like yes. to uh, i love it with the junior anything to get the kids involved because yeah. once the kids learn it'll keep growing with them as well yeah oh, yes, definitely. yeah we have a whole list of events so anything just give us a call or email me yeah email me and then we'll <laughs> we'll yeah that'll be great yeah yep yeah. yep <laughs> well thank you so much again yeah. jessica and everybody yes, that's still yeah. on thank you have a happy birthday tomorrow jessica oh, thank you <laughs> i won't send you any mosquitoes i'll stay away from you because the tigers <laughs> they find me <laughs> 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 Yeah, I keep forgetting it's my birthday. I just got all red oh. in the face, I know. <laughs> Enjoy, Enjoy. Enjoy. But you forget. Come on. <laughs> There's just it's so much, you know, with with everything going on. But yeah, I don't. If if you want to send out to um people from other counties, 